But so working together um, means standards. Um, I think we're doing some good work here already that we, we share some standards. Um, and the good thing is that we don't have to agree on everything. So the, the layered compatibility of Buffalo is really important. Like we already agree on all the features, and that's great. Um, and we don't have to make the exact same choices regarding vocabularies to be compatible on, on, on some level. However, the, the set of things, or the exact set of things we need to be compatible about is something we should discuss. Because for instance, even though we're both using LDP, if you use LDP with different authentication mechanisms, we won't be able to do anything. Um, and this is a bit the devil and the details in the sense that standards are great and using multiple standards is also great, but even if you use the same set of standards and we're using the same set of standards, we might have different glue in between them. And, and the glue between the standards is something we should agree upon. I don't think we can really standard test it because otherwise we just have yet another standard and we need more glue. So, and, and that, that glue thing, those, I think, arbitrary decisions are things we need to talk about. What are your thoughts, Bill? I, I heard a number of things as we just went through those points, and to a great extent, we've got a lot of going and doing our own thing. Everyone's doing their own thing because everyone's different. And you just don't understand my use case because my use case is completely different from your use case. There's no similarities whatsoever, so I can't conceivably use the same thing as you do. Except you start looking at it, and your use case is exactly identical and you're doing exactly the same thing. So we've made a few arbitrary choices along the way that mean your use cases have got a few little wrinkles in them, but they're really the same. And I find myself now in an industry with PLM people who went down a path of saying, well, you're already doing the same thing, so I can give you a single unitary solution to all those pieces. And now they're finding out that, well, yeah, I can't make that work. And I've got to pull that to pieces and pulling to pieces what they've got that's been bound together in the way that it's been for a long period of time is extraordinarily difficult. And trying to make some of those pieces play with each other in various different places lead to activities going on. One, this thing that we're talking about here. But we heard earlier on about variability and the concepts of product line engineering and how we deal with the variability exchange language that says I want to be able to share some particular kind of information in a particular kind of space in a way that it's useful to lots of other places. And I think we're ending up with a lot, a lot of separate layers of particularity. A problem I need to solve is a particular way that problem has traditionally been solved. And now we're trying to pull that to a place of saying, I want to standardize solving that problem. Your standard API. I want to try and find a way of taking what we've done in various different ways and solve that particular slice in a consistent manner. But what is the method that we are going to apply so that we don't end up with, yeah, we've solved your problem with your API and we've solved the problem with the VEL and we've solved the problem with this. And yet now I've still got 57 different standards which I can mix in 57 different varieties and still end up with nobody's doing the same thing. Um, where, where have we got to? Are there any lessons that we can learn from the past? Have you maybe in your communities already had these exchanges with related efforts and how did that go? Can, can we reapply some good ideas for, from these efforts or uh, uh, things we should have Think about like OSLT has reached out to other engineering communities, um, but I would say with very informal ways of, of yeah exchanging, not 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 at a very technical level. I would say, um, Bill, you can say a bit more about this, but maybe you, Mike, um, in your well, space. Well, I'm, I'm not sure if this is in the same realm, but Bill made me think of a handful of things. One of the lessons that I learned from working in the HTTP space, just learning this back and reading this back and making later you know, contributions is, one of the things that HTTP did really well as a protocol, that's just as a, as a sort of an application of a protocol, is they said a whole bunch of these things are gonna be decided later by somebody else. 
right? Mm -hmm. They didn't say we're going to decide about security. We're going to insert a line that says security goes here. Now we'll suggest a starter, but we're going to create actually a pattern for declaring and negotiating security. So they said that way, 25 years from now, if we're still in business, which HTTP actually is, and we have lots better security, HTTP standard hasn't been broken. So they did that with a number of things, including the format of the message, the security of the message. Now they're even changing the underlying transport of the message, so newer versions of HTTP are gonna be not on TCP IP, but are gonna be on UDP. So they've done an excellent job, and this is what I was referring to in the layering side, not adding upon, adding upon variations, but deciding we're going to make this uh, a, a sort of an abstract pluggable thing. We're going to make security an, a, a, an abstract element. We're going to make formats, and so we're going to make vocabulary, all these other things. And that's allowed HTTP, and HTML is very similar. I mean, it's morphed. It's so different than when it was first conceived 25, 30 years ago, and yet it's still incredibly viable. It, it, it tends to be a thing none of us here even wants to negotiate. We don't suggest that we should maybe switch to CoAP or MQTT or something. We all just assume it's going to be HTTP. That's how pervasive and powerful it is. A standard is, is, you know a standard is really powerful when no one even thinks of replacing it, right? Which is not the hypermedia point of view or something like that. But isn't this not, not a little bit this, uh, contradicting our almost demand to look at a business case and what, what problem you can solve? In this case, you leave a little bit open. So, yeah, yeah we will, we will potentially have new business case in the future that we can solve with the same technology well, and we have we provide some Yeah, so some, some many, many, of the, many of the ones I described weren't business cases, but technical cases, right? And I think the other thing, it's, it's a really good point, you don't have to ignore the business case to say, you know what, people will invest in this product if they know that there are, can be changes in the future without breaking it. They will, that's a business case. If they instead know that every year I'm going to have to update this, every year this is going to change, that's a negative business case, right? So I think there's more to it than that. So I, I think that's one of the things. I think the other one that, that Phil reminded me of, and we didn't talk a lot about here, is one of the key design elements is deciding in these phone conversations or deciding in these communications what is structure and what is data. One of the things I think is really powerful about the linked data and RDF in general is at, at some level, everything is data in RDF. There's, it's a very simple structural element and allows you to do so many different things and um, that things that people hadn't even thought of because it's simply changing data, it's adding a class. For instance, well, you, know, you can get a, a, a rich set of hypermedia controls through just adding a vocabulary, even though it wasn't originally placed in there, right? So I think one of the other things is, is making sure that when we look at variations, Remember the line I had in the last slide uh, from uh, Paul Clements, good software architecture is knowing what changes a lot and makes that easy? Well, if we have a lot of variations in models, then you actually make that a feature of the model, not make another model, right? Uh, and there's a lot to what I just said there, which is um, wholly uninformed. But the point I'm trying to make is, if we know things are gonna have lots of variations, that's a feature that you build in rather than a, than a, a, a reality you fight. And I think actually that's one of the things I learned from the, from the RDF space is that you know, if you start looking at what's data and what's structure, uh, the more, more data you have, uh, the more you design in data, the more opportunity you have. I don't know if that really makes sense if I really kind of talk that way. Yeah, I say to the RDF as a person that I'm saying <laughs> But that's, I mean, that's you run any experiences with interacting with maybe with other communities and exchanging? And well, maybe negative experiences, but not interacting. Mm -hmm. um, so, and it, to me, it was a, a shock that I never heard about. It was a so, so you contacted me. I mean, I had heard about it, but only vaguely. And given that I've worked in the intersection of semantic up and APIs, it's almost unforgivable. <laughs> so I don't miss it. But um, it relates to something I, I, I said this morning, and something that I see that, I mean, in my community, being a semantic app community, that we've not brought up is actually looked at the world and, and see, like, do, do you want this stuff? Do you need this stuff? What are the conditions on which you, you want to use this stuff? And in particular, it goes to um, developers. Um, 
it turns out that after developing a, a heavy Java-based stack for 10 or 15 years, nobody outside of Office Manager community was really interested in, 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 in using that. Um, and it turns out the cool kids were doing other things. Um, so something that wasn't really concerned at, at, at first, like, oh, but they'll follow, um, became a concern because um, you cannot force people to, to do RDF. It, it's, I mean, if you're in the RDF world, it's easy to, to, to forget because it's a different way of thinking. Once you get it, everything is RDF, like hammer and nail. But the same hammer and nail that you have when you think RDF is what a lot of developers have when they think in objects. And you're not gonna convince them. Um, so you need to think in, in, in their, their terms as well and maybe think about, about bridging those things as well. And, and so that's a problem we have the semantic web community, but like normal people don't, don't want to use it. So we have to look at the latest trends, like GraphQL, or even development frameworks, and, and try to follow that. Um, and this is something where we as a semantic web community get stuck because a large part of us are academics, and we get paid to show, hey, this new thing works, and then we have to leave it. But like bringing this new thing and, and shaping it in a way that developers can use it and can start building things for that is, is so important. And, and you don't get credit for this in the semantic web community. And that's the reason why, or one of the important reasons I think why we're moving. So pay attention to people who are going to use these things. And if you're not focusing on end users, you're focusing on developers. So uh, empower them to do nice things. You mentioned, <coughs> if you think like a hammer and nail and glue, <laughs> and that reminded me that, that there is also some there is responsibility at the end user side of what they want, right? Because I mean you build your house to live in, in it yourself. And if people don't want to use the internet they, they are free to use Bitnet or whatever. Um, um, so I think that is also a problem. I, I heard some expectations that vendors do it and standards do it and things like that. But I think there is also some responsibility on the answer the side to understand what's going on and to build the house they want to live on. And for that, you, you need standards, but you also need the material to, to glue them together. And that is something end users must be able to do. Right? In, and in the same way you build your house, I mean, if all the pipes don't fit together, that's, that sucks. But if every house looks the same, that sucks also. Yeah, yeah. that's mm -hmm. exactly right. Yeah. right? That's, I think that's one of the other big things that we have to get used to, and that is not everyone's going to wear the same outfit, right? We need to give people the power of choice, and we also, I think, what I was hearing when, when he was talking about a nail and hammer and glue, I was thinking the same kind of deal. Let's talk about tools. He's yeah. talking about it's tools. Exactly cool. And so I think the, most, the more powerful tools that we have available to us are actually the simple ones. Right? So making sure that we also produce simple tools. I think one of the things that uh, Ruben's been talking about and then uh, Philip was also talking about is the notion of making um, graphs or making RDF or anything, making it fun or making it easier or making it simpler. I think it's a fantastic idea. It's the same challenges that happen in this hypermedia space, right? We have, we have a tendency to do a lot of the same things, a lot of research people. I know if you don't understand the cybermedia thing, well, you, you know, you just need to walk off or something. That's, you're not getting anywhere, right? And we don't have good tools in this space either. Yeah, so I think you're, you're quite right in, in providing people tools and then they get creative. And then they start putting things together. And a pattern that I see in, in customers I work with is often they'll build, they'll use simple tools to build something that barely works. But if everybody starts asking for that, it's like, well, now let's invest a little bit and let's build a more solid version of that, right? So I think that's a pattern too. Getting rid of the upfront, working with simple tools, paying attention to what users build and say, oh, I think I can build a stronger one of those if you'd like. So I think that's another big part of it. So making sure you pay attention to developers, making sure you, you have enough tools running about it, and then paying attention to what they ask for. I think that's big. I, I think we've uh, opened up another storyline here that goes in an interesting direction. I agree, you want to give the people we are dealing with simple tools, but I don't want to give people the needle and thread and the sheet of material and say, hey, go make your own travels. You don't want to, or you think I they don't, don't want it? I, I think that there's a community out there that wants to be able to make clothes, yeah. but there's another community out there that wants to be able to make up an outfit out of a combination of pre-made clothes. Right. I don't want to have to go 
to somebody and say, here's a pile of plastic. See if you can extrude this into water types. Do you want to prevent everybody from but doing that? But somebody wants to do that. That's right. right. Yeah. So you need to be thinking about, it's not a set of simple tools. It's a set of simple tools for that problem, and it's a set of maybe very complex tools for that other problem. Yeah, it yeah. has to be able to generate a plastic pipe that's yeah. exactly so, the right diameter, so that yeah. when I put them together just like that, I use no tools in the latest plumbing repair I use at home because the two things connected. And it works, and this is maybe where we get to with Axel's standardized API. I can put these two pipes together and they just connect. I don't even need any tools at that no. sort of space. But you somebody yeah. somewhere had to have some really, really good tools to be able to make those two connectors fit. And we need to make sure that as we go down the path we're going down, we're dealing with the right tools for the right people for the right piece of that puzzle. Because I think with OSLC, we probably aren't delivering to me with the two pipes that fit together, we're delivering to the guy who made the fittings that made that possible, so that when I, as an end user at that level, say, I just want hot water, I don't care how you make plastic pipes or how you heat water, I just want a hot shower, but I'm delivering to the right people. There's a number of different layers in that supply chain, if you like, picking on this analogy that's been following here. And I've got to think about the levels in that supply chain and make sure we've got the right tools for each of those levels, because it's not ubiquitous. Right. But no matter on which level you are, you have to take certain responsibility for that one you think was the right thing you need. <laughs> so and, and that's what I'm a little bit missing here, so that looking at the, at the vendor say, hey, give me what I need, and, and we ask back what is what you need, and you're getting not really the the, the use cases they want to use it for, but, but just another technology they are used to. So we have also the chance to, to teach the community what's possible yeah. and what yeah. they could do if, yeah. if we just make this, go this level up there. And then still they need, and, and I, I disagree a little bit, this is global data models or, or a, a semantic uh, model for everybody. So I think really you need to develop, you need to take the responsibility for your model how you work and what, what objects you need and how they fit together, which relationships do you have. That's that's you, you can have some examples that you can adapt, but it's the same the same thing. You have to take the responsibility for this your specific data model, but as well as your how to use the underlying technology, which level, whatever, so but to fit them together. Yeah, one of the challenges I think it's a quote that's attributed to Henry Ford, the automobile Henry Ford. Uh, somebody said um, what would, you know, do you talk to customers or something like this early on? He said, well, if I asked customers what they wanted, they would just say they wanted a faster horse. Right. They're not always thinking in the same way that some creative person might think. I think that may be part of what you're talking about, right? So it, it's, it's a matter of give and take. You know, the first jet airplanes looked exactly like propeller airplanes. The first propeller airplanes were all bi-wing <coughs> planes, right? So we have all these things where we have to sort of get past the next thing. The first automobile literally looked like a carriage without a horse in front of it. So the things that I'm gonna tell you in the beginning are gonna look amazingly like what I've already seen. Even though I probably don't need, what I need is something very different. I don't know, because I haven't seen one, I'm just a loser, right? So I need that, I need that, inter that feedback and that interplay. Okay, I'll give you one that looks like this, but maybe, you know, I'll, I'll show you another one over here. Right? And I think that's where, Building smaller things as a test can be very, very powerful. Yeah, that's a little bit of what we're struggling here to find this or to yep. find a good map of how, how to get this yeah. this dialogue or this, this interaction started with, with the end users and yeah. between between the, the, the service providers or the tool providers to do <coughs> this up to flow. And it's not the responsibility from one side. They are here we have yeah. it and that's probably what you should use and what you need or a lot yeah. of that. Yep. You have a clear understanding of what we need and you just have to, to implement it for, for, for me. For us, yeah. just do it. So yeah. it's, it's an interactive thing that we need to get this going. Small question I had from my side, uh, maybe to Mike and, and Ruben. Do you think that uh, we could find we could find potential end users uh, of OSLC in your communities? Uh, you know, focused on on the you know on integration of development environments. Do you think that you have such potential end users, and would it make sense to? Present a bit more what we are doing with Voice NC in your communities, in your events. Second thing, for absolute sure. 
Um, for instance, you know, we've talked about this, we have this Rest Fest event right every year. Mm -hmm. And this would be a fantastic material to present at that event, right? And that's, that's the same kind of thing. It's a relatively small community of 40 or 35, 40, 50 people that are sort of the thought leader types, but it's very much in the same sort of realm. Um, and in fact, I don't know it because uh, I'm a bit, I feel a bit like Ruben. It's like, oh my gosh, how have I not for the last 10 years been doing this? Um, but if you show up, somebody else might say, oh yeah, we do that. And I never, I've never known to ask the question, right? I don't even know to ask the question. So yes, I think that's, I think that's an important element in, uh, to consider, and that is, I would be happy to extend an invitation right now for that. Just along that line, maybe another thought what we tried in the past to collocate events like that so that we have yeah. our OCC fest yeah. right the next day after your red yeah. fest and the OCC rest yeah. together and so we can yeah. just pinpoint to the post community. Yeah. Yeah. Solid, solid, right? yep. solid fest the first day. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, solid right. fest. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Let's do a fest fest then. Yes. <laughs> I think it's actually part of a, a larger problem in the sense that, I mean, I like the community, but we're preaching to the choir. Like, yeah. There's a few things I'm going to say you can disagree with. And the same thing is in the semantic web community. Like, they're already convinced about semantic web, so, so that, that there's no education or preaching to, to be done there. Um, so I'll just speak for myself. Like, I think the longer I've been going to the semantic web um, conferences that we have, the more I think that it's not the right place. because. I mean, we need people who don't know about semantic web um, to see a solution. So I believe much more in going to the same software, the biomedical uh, community, saying, like, hey, you got a problem that we can solve with semantic web technology, that we can solve with OpenSea. And, and, and so, but, but this is much more work, mm -hmm. because you every time have to reach out to, to different communities. So I think I'd be really interested in seeing, seeing broader effects. So not just technology specific, but real kind of problem domain. More vertical than horizontal. Um, but that's that, 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 but, but yeah, for the latter thing, I just noticed that it's repeated in the past. Like you show it once and they've seen it, but you need to keep on the yeah. attention on that. Yeah. And what, what doesn't work, in my experience, is dragging those people into your conference. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's good. So, your, so you're not going to find end users at a semantic web conference, because if they knew that semantic web could, could be a solution, then you would need to be there. Really. What you are going to find is companies who build solutions for end users, and they might have heard about See, and you might be like, okay, that's a solution that we should incorporate. But directly to end users, you need to be at the domain specific place. That's good. Uh, I think a lot of the time, here with OSLC, with semantic web, with each of these topics, we are focused upon a developer community in terms of what is available. It's not a product, it's not something an end user can buy and use off the shelf just like that. They need somebody else to turn this idea into something they can use. Nobody's going to sit there and break Facebook down and separate the data and the services. They can't do that. So, so it's, it's all very interesting, but they can't apply it. We've got to find a way to deliver applicability of these things to the places that they can be used, as opposed to delivering a clever idea. Because otherwise, it's just an academic process. And we just, like we said, talk to the people who also understand that academic process. I like the semantic web stuff. It's got lots of good things it can do for my customer because it can solve some problems. But I can't sell the semantic web. I've got to go and deliver them a something they can use that applies that to the problem they're doing. The same thing with OSLC. I can't sell them an OSLC, but I can sell them something that gives them interoperability because OSLC enables that. Semantic web then lets me intuitively figure out what it is they're trying to do with that, but it's a wonderful information they have out there, rather than trying to figure it out themselves manually, and so on. But we've got to get that next step and to find the audience that you can go to with that if you're not looking at the same people we are. And this is why I think academia and industry need to work together, because our burden of 
prove is different. Like I can go to a community and say like, hey, this problem, this is how you could tackle it. But I, I mean, I can just show it and then I can leave because I don't have a product. Industry needs to have a product, but they can just, just go like go and say, hey, it works, and and, and then I'll leave again. So specifically for this, um, like given that my proof is that hey, it works. Um, if you have use cases, bring them to ac academia, and we can investigate. Like, okay, this is a spark. This is how it should work. We can get people curious. And if you notice that the evidence is mutual, this is where industry can, can take over. So this, mm -hmm. these kind of pipelines are also super important to think about. Mm -hmm. We have five more minutes left. Any questions? Just before we lose the five minutes, I found mm -hmm. learned a lot in the, the studio space, and especially like this idea uh, that for business cases, you not have to consider the short-term payback things, but a lot of other things like your your uh, presentation room, how, how much value is if you're the owner of your own data, you don't have to give your data away. So that's definitely something and considerations that uh, you have to put in your business case, it's not just, oh, if I build this adapter for an OSLC for this thing, yeah, I will save so many bucks in the next five weeks or something like that. So that's always the, what I'm here hearing back, so the short time revenue, but we have to, if we really want to make those new technologies a success, we have to, to point out those other values that come in with it. And, and there may be even, if you if you can put a price tag on it, much higher than than the actually saving on time with, with implementation. And the second thing is, is that really, what we all have in common, but we may not have solved it, that is this uh, authentication and authorization uh, thing. So that's definitely something we need to work together on. Not like you said, if you don't agree on driving on one side of the street, so we are really lost. And, and, and this agreement here is, I think, is, is this, this authorization and authentication. That's a, a fundamental problem we have to solve all together and agree on either the left side or the right side. We don't care which one, but <laughs> one, we agree on one is important. And, and that's what we should work together also uh, and, and propose a solution to our, all our community. To continue this, I think especially for authentication, the kind of hooks mechanism that HTTP has is important. Because we're gonna, not going to agree upon one single standard, so we need a hook that we all can agree on. Yeah. Even if it's a meta, meta thing, uh, yes, yes, right. So, so that's and even if, even if we agree today, yeah. somebody's going to come up with a much better idea mm -hmm. seven years from now, and we don't want to be stuck saying, sorry, we can't. That's where the hooks thing, I think, is such a powerful device. But this is very hard. I mean, when how do you start that? I mean, you, 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 we, we need to discuss uh, between each other, we need to organize some meetings, and then yeah. it takes time, it takes yeah. energy. Yeah. So it's like, a, yeah, it's, it's not free of charge. But, uh, yeah, but so the starting uh, point with the, is already to, today what we learned, okay, there are this and this and this standard available so to, to, to choose from. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have an overview what all what all of the authentication standards are available. So in, And you made some experience with it. So that's, that gives us already a, a yeah. first step. Yeah. And we should take it from there. And then say, yeah, maybe it's not good to, to look at one specific, but we do it more generic. So it's yeah. just a, a meta model of authentication and, yes. and, and to be flexible for more for changes, but still uh, uh, um, uh, agree on the same principle. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, I think that's the one thing we definitely should, should look at together. Uh, maybe not in the whole group, but, but should come up with a, with a consolidated view on that. Agree with that's it, like no more time. Uh, I mean, yeah, if you have like some burning questions, uh, Axel, but maybe we should, uh, okay. maybe we should wrap up. Well, I don't have any more questions. Um, I would I thank you very much for coming, uh, especially uh, Mike and, and Ruben. You came here without really knowing probably what, <laughs> what this test would be, and uh, knowing that this would be a great event, that's what I came here. And Thank you. you made it great, and uh, thank you very much for coming. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And uh, let's have a break, a sweet break this time.